Good afternoon. Welcome to a Calvinian architecture, the reading of a number of stories from a book titled A Calvinian Architecture, written some 20 years ago. These are verses two and three from the third octave, second chapter, Armilla. We gather at the North Egmont hut. There are three of us, me, Ian McAlpine, who is the guide, and his support climber, Heather. We're equipped with tents and wet weather gear. Thick clouds are moving in over Taranaki, but Ian is optimistic. I wonder what's waiting for us up there and how hard it will be. I've never climbed before. We put on our packs and start walking. Soon the path leaves the woods and begins to steepen. The gradient changes from difficult to impossible as it narrows. It feels like we're climbing the mountain vertically. Each step requires a concentrated effort. Ian is smiling. He's seen it all before. He holds the record for most climbs of the mountain in a single day. Once when he was in his late twenties, he climbed up and down it three times starting well before dawn and finishing after dusk. Once a rhythm can be established, the climb becomes just a little more manageable, he tells me. So much of it is mental, I realize. My legs are holding out and so are my lungs, but my mind is faltering. The mountain ahead seems alternately impossible, then friendly, as though I'm either walking up a sheet of glass or along a seashore. We hit a steep gravel gradient called the Lung Buster, and now I understand why. It's three steps forward and two back all the way up. The ski poles Ian gave me back at the hut seemed then an encumbrance, and I begrudgingly undid my pack to fit them in, but now they're a godsend. Without them, I'd probably slip all the way back to the bottom. After an hour, the lung buster, we reach a bend and walk straight into solid cloud. We can't see more than a few meters. The rain begins at first softly, soon steadily. The temperature has dropped almost 20 degrees in a matter of minutes. Ian looks serious now. We stop to put thermal layers on, but we have to take our wet clothes off first and suddenly everything freezes. I can't move my fingers. We try and help each other to zip our coats up tight with fingers that won't bend. The frozen sweat under the rubber snow coats lowers our body temperature dramatically. Ian clearly feels the risk is too high to go on even though we're just below the snow line. Our plan was to climb all the way into Taranaki's crater and camp there overnight for the full moon. I was to make the last and seventh blindfold painting on pure white snow. Now it seems that won't be possible. Ian offers to climb up into the crater to get whatever snow he can find and he scampers off and is back within a few minutes. We're so numb we can't speak. He packs the snow and ice into the little ice box that's been prepared to keep it frozen until we can get it back to the gallery in New Plymouth. Under the double thermic glass, the few handfuls of snow look inconsequential, but I'm so very glad we have it. We begin to the scent, soon the snow and sleet turn into ice cold rain. We walk down rock faces that only a few hundred feet down from the crater's peak have turned into icy waterfalls. We have no choice but to walk under them into gullies and rivers. Everything is saturated, but I'm slowly beginning to feel my fingers again. We move on through pools of mud. We climb and descend, climb and descend. We find steps cut into stone. Others are improvised as we go. The rushing water has revealed the substructure of the mountain and it's all made of rock and water tumbling down it. At sundown, we reached Tanyurangi Lodge. 
would catch sight of it down in the valley through mist and rain and we lift our heads then and feel we can afford to speak a little. The descent until that moment has been entirely silent with the effort of surviving the thundering water. We stagger inside the lodge and peel away layers of saturated steamy clothing. The heater has to be primed every half hour but at least there's no water falling over us. Ian prepares a meal by torchlight. I feel gratitude for his ability to concentrate and get on with the necessary procedures. We eat silently in the torches penumbra. I then sit with the icebox on my lap and take the glass cover off. Ian blindfolds me. I squeeze the contents of a small tube of white oil paint onto the snow. I pick up a brush and let it sit in what I imagine is a glistening white on white. I sit like that for a long time. The brush touches the paint. The rain keeps roaring outside. I can hear it driving steadily into the roof and sides of the lodge, gushing and pouring over the gutters. It rains like that for another two days. On the second in the late evening, we climb down to North Egmont again. We take some photos. The sky partially clears to reveal faraway Paratutu sitting up on the edge of the sea. Behind me, Taranaki's peak is still covered in cloud, but somehow tonight it's different because I now know what's under there. Everything around me is melancholy as though the world knows it can't help being utterly itself. I open the blue bag with the icebox in it and look through the glass. The white paint has sunk inside the, the ice and has almost disappeared. How insignificant, insignificant it looks, how ephemeral, how strange. For a moment now, the sky around the peak is clear of clouds and Taranaki catches the last rays of the sun. Very briefly, everything makes perfect sense in the sea of impermanence within the vast everlasting ocean of contradiction. Perfect sense, but I don't linger there. I begin to pack things quickly into back of the car before darkness falls over us again. I'm about to shut the boot and suddenly on impulse, I pull the spade out from under the bags and coats I walk over into the scrub and dig a small hole, an inconsequentially small hole. Then I get the icebox out of the blue bag and slide the glass top out. The ice and snow and paint have all coalesced into a fantastic micro world of craters, glaciers, ravines, icebergs and canyons. I walk over to the hole and in one smooth movement, I pour the entire contents down into it. Then I cover it up with some of the freshly dug earth. I put the spade back in the boot and I drive off down the mountain very, very slowly, very slowly. With the empty icebox on the seat beside me. The sounds you might be able to hear are a flock of pigeons circling overhead as they do every day. A wondrous sight and a wondrous musical sound, a very soft sound. I hope you join me tomorrow for third octave, third chapter. Chloe, I look forward to seeing you then.